Hi, everybody, and welcome to Adam's October webinar, Successfully Defending Outpatient Authorization Denials. Very, very glad that you could join us today. Uh, our presenters today are Denise Wilson and Reggie Allen, and uh, let's get going. Okay, you will, should be able to see a little control panel, and uh, you can open and close your control panel there. Join the audio. You can choose mic and speakers, choose telephone, uh, download handouts. You have handouts here and they are ready for you. And if you want to submit questions and comments via the questions panel, this is where you would do that. And we would ask that uh, any questions that you ask here are related to this webinar that we are giving. Uh, in the Adam website, we do have an Ask the Expert section, and the link to that is right there. So any questions you might have that are not related to this webinar, you, if you could go to the Ask, Ask the Ask Expert site, can't talk, that would be great. Thank you. The ease and contact hours. Free CEUs, as always, are offered to ADAM members only. To obtain the CEUs, you have to attend the live webinar for at least 50, we need to change that to 56, 50, 54, 54 minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah, 54 minutes, and complete the survey that will pop up automatically for you at the end of the webinar. We will uh, email the CEU certificates to you. CEUs are not available just for watching the recording of the live webinar. And a uh, very important disclosure, no individuals in a position to co control content for this activity have any relevant financial relationships to declare. So from that survey at the end, you will be pre prompted to select the CEUs that you want. You can pick one, you can pick all. You can pick whichever ones uh, are applicable to you. And uh, do you need to read this from the ANCC? Uh, the Nursing Continuing Professional Development Activity was approved by the Northeast Multi State Division Education Unit, an accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. We are not moving. Let me try this. Seem to be frozen up here. There we go. Okay, join us for our next complimentary webinar, which will be a hot topic, Medicare Advantage and the Two Midnight Rule in 2024. It'll be on November 29th at 2 Eastern. CEUs for Adam members only. And the homepage website uh, is given there, and you can register there. ADAM, the Association for Healthcare Denial and Appeal Management, is the nation's only association dedicated to healthcare denial and appeal management. Our mission is to support and promote those professionals working in this field uh, of healthcare insurance denial and appeal management through education and collaboration. And our vision is to create an even playing field where patients and healthcare providers are successful in persuading medical insurers to make proper payment decisions. And, excuse me, Adam is created through the generous support of Payer Watch. Uh, Payer, Payer Watch is uh, separated into appeal masters in which thousands have been trained in denial and appeal management over the years. Uh, we believe strongly in taking your appeals all the way as far as you can go. And we do like to have a clinical legal approach. Uh, found that to be very helpful. And the other side of Payer Watch is Payer Watch Veracity, which is uh, software. Uh, the, the software, the Veracity, is a leader in the industry and it's always in service to providers protecting the revenue. Now I do have to read this. Uh, the Association for Healthcare Denial and Appeal Management publishes and distributes materials on its website that are created by our members or invited industry subject matter experts for the benefit of all ADAM members. ADAM does not certify the accuracy or authority of these materials. 
These materials are distributed and presented as research information to be used by ADAM members in conjunction with other research deemed necessary in the exercise of ADAM members' independent professional judgment. ADAM claims no liability in relation to reliance on the content of these materials. The views expressed in the materials or the views of the materials authors do not necessarily represent the views of ADAM. Any references are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute endorsement of any sources. There are no conflicts of interest to declare for any individual in a position to control the content of this presentation. And uh, many of you know Denise. Denise Wilson is our Senior Vice President for Payer Watch and Appeal Masters and President of Adam. Denise has over 30 years of experience in healthcare, including clinical management, education, compliance, appeal writing. Uh, she is an expert in uh, medical appeals, manage hundreds of cases of Medicare, manage Medicare, commercial, hundreds and hundreds of cases to the administrative law judge. She's a national known speaker, dynamic ed educator on Medicare and commercial appeals processes and just a whole raft of things. And she has educated thousands of healthcare professionals like you around the country in successfully overturning healthcare denials. And we are also pleased to announce uh, Reggie Allen is with us. Reggie is the Chief of Clinical and Business Operations at Payer Watch. And Reggie has more than 35 years of experience in a variety of healthcare positions, many, many. He's been recognized nationally as an expert in care management and clinical operations. He's a results-driven leader, and I can attest to that, who emphasizes operational transformation by integrating clinical and financial care aspects. Uh, you can read you know, about his education history and Reggie possesses comprehensive knowledge and experience in all facets of care management. He has designed and implemented an enterprise-wide clinical appeals unit and a clinical documentation program with outstanding success. Using Six Sigma and Lean principles, he's an expert in clinical and operational efficiencies that enhance clinical outcomes and financial performance through a variety of methodologies. So we are very glad to have Denise and Reggie here. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Denise. Just give us one second here. You have it there, Denise? Yeah. OK. All right, so um, before I get started with my content, I just want to make two quick um, but exciting announcements. One is that we are soon to launch a um, community forum on our Adam website where you'll be able to uh, enter questions, um, see what questions other people have, have entered, other members have entered, it's a members only benefits, you'll be able to respond to those questions, we'll be able to respond to your questions, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get some um, dialogue going in our community forum. So be on the lookout for that announcement uh, coming soon. And then also we are doing our first uh, virtual workshop uh, this winter. We're calling it the Winter Workshop. It's going to be at the end of uh, January, and we're going to have several tracks on um, appeals in medical necessity, coding, clinical validation. We're going to have a track on revenue cycle as well. Um, and so that announcement will be coming out soon um, and registration will be opening um, in the next several weeks. So keep your eye out for that. Of course, we will um, send that out in our weekly little brief newsletter brief, news update brief. That goes out every week. If you're not signed up for that, you can sign up for it on our Adam website. Um, there, on the home page, the Adam website home page, there's a link where you can sign up for our newsletters, and that will keep you in the know for the new things that are coming on board for our members and non-members. Um, so make sure you do that. Of course, we'll be uh, putting information on our website as well as on LinkedIn about these upcoming uh, new exciting things that we're going to be offering. Okay, let's get into our content. Um, 
pre-authorization, I always like to start with just some basic information about whatever the topic is, because we have folks from the very new newbies all the way to seasoned professionals on these webinars, so I want to make sure everyone is included. So pre-authorization is essentially a decision that your health insurer makes about uh, your healthcare service, your treatment plan, prescription drugs, DME, um, whether or not those services are medically necessary for you. Uh, sometimes it's called prior authorization. That's, I think, what I use most often. Prior authorization might be called prior approval. It might be called pre-certification. So your individual health insurance plan may require prior authorization for certain services before you receive them, except in an emergency. Okay, so they can't require a prior authorization if you have an emergency in your in the uh, emergency room being treated. Uh, obtaining prior authorization for the services isn't a promise that your insurance is going to pay or the plan will cover the cost but it is required, you know, for some services before you receive them. The process is utilized by health plans to ensure the reason they have this in place is they want to ensure that the services being provided are evidence-based, medically necessary, they are effective and safe for you, and they are cost-efficient. So they're not going to pay for you to have a knee replacement surgery because you start having knee pain going up and down the stairs. Okay, they want to make sure that they are going through the, um, that you're getting, um, now I'm, I'm thrown off because I hear an echo in the background. Is there someone that needs, should be muted that isn't? Okay. So cost efficiency, they're not going to go straight to doing a knee replacement on you because you're having knee pain going up and down the stairs. They want to make sure that you've had more conservative care done prior to jumping to the most expensive care that's out there. All right, so some of the uh, cons to or, you know, the bad side of having to go through the pre-authorization process is that it is burdensome on your providers. Um, and there can be a delay in or non-coverage of services for patients because you do have to go through this pre-authorization or prior authorization process. All right, so um, all right, so one thing I want to talk about is that there is a change in um, prior authorization that is coming down the pike sometime in the future. Um, but there's also this um, prior authorization rule that is going into effect actually um, starting in January of 2024. So the new, it's, it's, it's more of a clarification of a rule from Medicare um, regarding Medicare Advantage plans where they have said that if the MA organization, Medicare Advantage organization, if they approve a furnishing of a covered item or service through a prior authorization process, they cannot come back and deny it later based on the lack of medical necessity. Okay, what we have in the books right, right now, which is the bottom statement I have on this slide, is there's this kind of, um, there's a statement that kind of stands out by its within this chapter on the Medicare Manage Care Manual, and it's really hard to interpret what the meaning is behind it. It says that if a plan approves the furnishing of a service through an advanced determination of coverage, it can't deny coverage later um, on the basis of a lack of medical necessity. So that's what we have now, that with the um, final rule from Medicare on Medicare Advantage plans, which is going to affect July 1st, 2024, that we will be discussing on our November 29th webinar, they have clarified it with the statement um, up above. So you need to be aware of that because that is one of the arguments that you can make when you're talking about um, denials around prior authorization of your services. <clears throat> okay. 
I'm going to let uh, Reggie speak for the next few slides and give us uh, his input on to, uh, about the prior authorization process and good process flow. So go ahead, Reg. Great. Um, thank you very much. You want to probably bring up all the other ones, the twos, and we can just go through them fairly uh, quickly. I think the last time what I tried to do was do this for the, uh, thank you, for the outpatient for the inpatient flow, and I want to talk a little bit about the outpatient authorization flow. Some of the some of the issues and things that we see uh, as I oversee uh, the appeal writing uh, for the staff that we have that are writing them. And so, without clients, I can share a lot of the cases that I'm sure that many of you will be able to resonate. And I'm going to give you a bigger bonus uh, because I'm not only going to tell you some of the things that we're seeing uh, pre-authorization, but I'm also going to tell you some of the things that get us trouble post when we try to actually get these claims paid. So it all really starts with scheduling the procedure, uh, the schedule procedure with the, the surgery or diagnosis is really starts uh, in the physician's office. And then from the physician's office, many of you know that the physician gets an authorization number and they're also responsible as they are in step four for ob obviously uh, obtaining a patient status uh, for, the, for the patient. And then when it comes to the hospital, we should be verifying uh, insurance eligibility, making sure we have authorization requirements. And then really uh, five and six is gonna be really important that we talk about verifying the physician's information uh, with the patient. And then of course our scheduling department and insurance department, they usually notify the patient, uh, verify the insurance procedure, any out-of-pocket amount. And then the number eight, which is a hot another one is notifying the insurance for different or added procedures. So I think a lot of the stuff that I want to share, I could probably talk about here, and then you'll see some of it coming up in the next couple of slides. But I think I'll be able to help you guys better understand what we're seeing um, pre and, and, and post authorization on an outpatient base. The biggest thing that we have to do, we don't see a lot of uh, authorization, uh, delays in authorization denials unless we're not making sure we're getting all the information to the payer. Uh, there are three things that typically really cause us problems with outpatient denials, uh, and that is one, first, getting authorization, uh, knowing exactly what your payers, which payers, what, what, what procedures have to be authorized and which procedures obviously don't require authorization. There's a trick to that, too, so we'll talk about that. And then... Uh, the authorization that's scary, which I see many of the times, the physicians are obtaining an authorization number, but many times that authorization is really for the physician and not necessary for the facility. So in this outpatient authorization flow from the pre where we're, where we're getting issues uh, come is, is that we, we don't verify with the insurance company the authorization for us. Many many of us just take the number that they give to the physician and whatever the status that the physician uh, states, the patient status that the patient is going to be in, as opposed to verifying, making that call out to the insurance company to make sure that we're getting covered, that it is the, the right procedure and that we have an authorization that we're getting paid and putting the patient in the right status. Uh, the other issues that uh, I that I see there as I've developed some of those is here is that um, we 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 need to make every effort if we can for elective procedures to try to get that information referrals from the physicians a week in advance so we do have time to take care of number seven. Um, um, and, and that is obviously to be able to uh, let the patients know what their out of pocket is and then get it verified. And so we need to uh, really work with the physicians to kind of do that um, uh, in a more timely fashion. I'll talk about a little bit more about conservative measures and the add on procedures. Uh, but those, I would say, the three biggest things from our standpoint is one, uh, getting the right procedure done. Um, getting the authorization that the hospital needs because most of the time it just uh, knowing uh, it's just really a physician authorization and number two the bigger one is knowing 
what is being required to be authorized, uh, which procedures need authorization, and which ones do not. And that can be very tricky, and I'll, I'll share some more with that later. Next slide. So uh, I've talked about the, 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 the couple of reasons we've been tracking those, uh, as I told you first about the ones about, the first three I've already told you about. Uh, number one is that we find post that many of the, uh, must allow the documentation uh, does not support the medical necessity of the pr procedure. This one is probably one of the biggest ones that we're seeing uh, right now is missing physician office notes. So most of you are aware or are, are, are aware that uh, one of the biggest things that you have to do uh, and many of the procedures that are out there today, we need surgical notes uh, uh, in order, we need office notes, I'm sorry, in order to move forward. For example, many of you guys know with spinal cord stimulators and uh, with the total knees that are going on now where we need to know what the conservative treatment was done for the patient before. Did they have injections? What did they have PT? Do they have decreased ADLs? Most of these things are all done outside the hospital setting. Uh, bariatric surgery is another big one. Uh, we're not seeing where the patients had the psychological counseling. Uh, the same with the Tavros and the Watchmans, big time, high dollar procedures. There are a lot of, and Denise will talk about those, NCDs and LCDs, there are things that have to be covered. Those are found in the physician's records. And I will just tell you uh, right now in a practice setting, sort of, and, and actually being at a health system, putting some of these things in place, uh, really, it starts in the operating room. We should not be doing these. These procedures are pretty much well known. Should not be doing these procedures in the operating room without making sure that we have the the notes in uh, in the in the medical record. Before, in fact, some of these, because in many cases, these are compliance issues, especially with Medicare. When they when they review the medical record, they're looking for that conservative treatment that was done prior to bringing the, the patients in. So I think we really need to be very, very careful about um, making sure uh, that we are that we have those uh, that documented very well, and we have the physician's records before uh, hand that we do that. Uh, and then I think a couple other things I wanted to share, and that was the most of the surgical notes, most of you guys know, the surgeons don't necessarily write a good h and uh, One of the bigger issues that we're seeing, and not just from a um, medical necessity at the very beginning, but now seeing a lot of denials from audits uh, where uh, I'm seeing uh, uh, cases where uh, the, the documentation of the medical necessity wasn't very good or they're coding things that really uh, a lot of the hospitals now have been moved towards moving CDI specialists into the outpatient arena. Uh, I see stuff all the time where uh, they do the procedure, they say the patient has acute, uh, acute congested heart failure. However, it's not acute because it's under control. They're not treated. They're coming in for an outpatient procedure, but they put in that they have acute heart failure and we didn't give them any LASIKs or anything because they didn't need any yet. It was all under control when they got there. So many of the hospital systems now are move, moving towards putting CDI specialists, especially looking where we have high dollar in the cardiac arena uh, and you want the pediatric arena now to make sure that we are actually getting the documentation that we need. Uh, the third thing I think that I really wanted to also talk about is that when, they're, when we're getting authorization, uh, we need to be very, very careful, not only about, uh, the pr about procedures that need conservative treatment, but we're also seeing where doctors are naming the procedure that they're going to do, but sometimes there are procedures that precede those that need uh, authorization as well. For example, uh, the doctors in cardiac says they're gonna do ablation but they also do the 3D mapping procedure. You have to have authorization for that. You can't do the ablation without the 3D. So really when they do, they when they write and do these operaments and they're getting authorizations, they need to make sure if there are other components of that that need authorization, that it's not only all included on the uh, in the in the uh, consent, but also they're getting authorization for that at the same time. Also seeing some interesting things. Some of you guys may be doing some of these intravessel uh, lithotripsies and then inserting stents. 
both of those, the the, the uh, intravascular uh, uh, lithotripsy needs to be authorized as well as the stent. Many times the doctors just write the stenting that they're going to do and not the, the first part of the procedure. So the, the lithotripsy, which is very expensive, gets denied. Uh, and then obviously you're left there with the stenting, same with the ablation and leaving out the uh, 3D mapping procedure. So, I mean, these are just some really causes that we're actually seeing right now that you, if you've got those things going on, I would say the bigger takeaway for me here is to make sure that you work with surgery to make sure that they're getting those, uh, those physician office notes, because many of these cases, we cannot move forward uh, when we get them to appeal without requesting someone gets the physician office notes for us. Next slide. Um, and uh, we all familiar, don't have to worry about those anymore. You all know that if you're doing inpatient procedures uh, on lay, people doing them as outpatient, there is a way that you can get that done, obviously, if the patient expires or whatever, but you've got to put the, the, CO, the CA modifier on the claim. So they did bring that out a couple of years ago to help us take care of that. Uh, we're seeing lots of things with outdated, uh, outdated uh, charge masters. Uh, and the other one uh, we talked about was uh, care that was provided was not the same as authorized. And that was on the number eight on my slide. Most of you probably uh, know or should know in most of the contracts, you have 48 hours to notify the peer if an additional procedure was added. It's not uncommon for that to happen for doctors get in and they decide to do something else. But if that procedure needs to be authorized, uh, you need to have a system in place to maybe go back to your uh, insurance staff or whoever does the initial authorization to the payer, working with surgery to let them know this additional procedure was done on the patient, and you've got 48 hours to get that done. Otherwise, uh, those are easy, easy to get denied. And then I think one of the most simplistic thing that we see a lot that kicks your claim out right away with the insurance company is not having an authorization number on the claim. So we need to make sure we get the authorization number there. We also need to keep and be mindful. I look, when I look at claims and I see some of the authorization numbers, uh, most of you, most of the most of the peers now, the day span for the inpatient authorization is usually two or three days. And then the outpatient one is 30 days span. And I, I see in many cases, where uh, we are, we're putting a number out there, the authorization number, and I can tell, or most of you probably can tell as well, wait a minute, this was an inpatient procedure. There's a two to three stand. They don't give you a 30 day span to do an inpatient procedure. Uh, you usually get that on an outpatient one, but not on an inpatient one. So you just need to be very, very careful. Again, uh, when your staff are looking at it, that also when they're following up, you know, is this case, uh, uh, an inpatient status, outpatient status, did you get that information verified whether it was going to be inpatient or outpatient and uh, getting that taken care of up front. Next. Okay, Denise, we're on to you now. I think I've spilled my thunder if anybody will have later questions about me or things that we're seeing in appeals and challenges, that'll be great. Yeah, and at any time you want to jump in while I'm speaking, uh, Reggie, you're welcome to do that. Um, so I want to talk, I want to start off a little bit by talking about CMS and prior authorization, because when we're talking about prior authorization for outpatient services, we're pr primarily talking about commercial plans, which would include your Medicare Advantage plans. But CMS did, um, in the last few years, start a prior authorization program that they're following now for certain, they're calling certain, so only specific hospital outpatient department services. So OPD is what they call them, um, outpatient department services. Um, does not include ED, as we said before. Uh, you're going to review your Medicare administrative contractor policies to determine what the prior authorization requirements are for the particular services that CMS is requiring have a prior authorization. So you have to look to your MAC, your Medicare Administrative Contractor, that's the contractor for your area, to see what policies they have, which I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit. The hospital outpatient department is the one that's responsible for obtaining the authorization, prior authorization. Now, that doesn't mean the physician's off the hook if there's something he's going to be doing 
It just means that the hospital outpatient department holds the responsibility for making sure that that authorization is completed. Once they've requested authorization, the MAC has to respond to the hospital within 10 days to say yay or nay, we approve it or we don't approve it. You can, as a, as a provider, as a hospital outpatient department, you can get an exemption to the prior authorization process. Once you've de demonstrated to CMS over a period of time, you've been very compliant with following Medicare coverage coding and payment rules for these particular procedures and services. So um, you can bypass that process if you're a good steward of their monies and processes. So in 2020, um, these are the prior authorization procedures that CMS had on their list. They added a couple more in July of 2021, and then the one for 2023 that they added was facet joint interventions. The one from the ones from 2020, I think it's pretty clear that the reason, one of the main reasons that they do prior authorization, commercial payers and CMS, is they want to make sure that the services that you're providing are medically necessary and not cosmetic, because, you know, CMS doesn't pay for cosmetic procedures. And when you look through that list, of course, we've got our medical terms there on the left, left but you can actually put that into general terms, like blepharoplasty is, is an eye lift. Uh, botulinum toxin injections is Botox. Uh, paniculectomy is a tummy tuck. Rhinoplasty, nose job. Okay, so uh, those were pretty obvious of why CMS uh, picked those to start with because, um, yes, they can be done for cosmetic purposes and not just medical purposes. So for to obtain your detailed prior authorization requirements, you go to your MAC your, and look at your local coverage determinations and local coverage articles. So I'm going to talk about those. To meet the coverage criteria to have it pre-authorized or to obtain prior authorization, the medical record has to, has to contain the documentation that fully supports the necessity for the services, and that's what an LCD, which is the document published by your MAC, that's what the LCD is going to outline for you. So coming up in um, 2026, there's going to be some new requirements. There's a proposed rule out there right now that's going to apply to MA plans, uh, fee-for-service, state Medicaid and CHIP programs, Ma Medicaid managed care plans, CHIP managed care, and qualified health plans that are issued by um, on the exchange. Okay, and I've got links to all of these things that I'm talking about on your slides here if you want to go back and read up about them a little bit uh, more closely. So th this one's gonna, not going to start till 2026. But the proposed plan says um, they're expecting payers to adopt electronic prior authorization processes to make it simpler, easier, faster for providers to get that prior auth. They are going to uh, require payers to include a specific reason when they deny a prior auth request. Wouldn't that be nice to get the reason why? They're going to require that the prior auth decisions are issued within 72 hours. If it's, if it's an urgent request, a patient needs, you know, surgery right away, or seven calendar days for standard, not urgent requests. Where it's 10 days now, it'll be seven days. And then they also are going to have to publicly re report certain prior authorization metrics. So being a little bit more transparent to the public about what those payers are doing in the prior authorization arena. So let's talk a little bit about NCDs, LCDs, and clinical policy bulletins, because that's where you're going to find the requirements that you need to support the medical necessity of services that you're required to get prior authorization for. So a little primer on NCDs and LCDs. These are policies that CMS publishes. Um, the Medicare Administrative Contractors um, and Medicare administrative contractors publish them as well, and it's a way to help manage costs and utilization of healthcare. So NCDs are written by CMS, and they apply to all Medicare beneficiaries across the country. Doesn't matter what MAC you are under in your region, if it's an NCD, it applies to your patient's 
who are under traditional fee-for-service Medicare, um, and managed Medicare services as well, okay? So it's not just traditional fee-for-service, it's also managed Medicare. NCDs apply to those, um, and like I said, all, all across the country. And then LCDs are similar to NCDs, but they're written and published by your MAC, which is your local contractor. They also apply to fee-for-service and managed Medicare claims. LCDs apply to Medicare management claims in the MAC jurisdiction where the LCD was published. So only in that jurisdiction um, do they apply. They typically, both NCDs and LCDs, typically address coverage of diagnostic and therapeutic services like home health visits, they are focused on procedures and services that are high, high cost, questionable diagnostic or therapeutic value, just like, you know, the blepharoplasty and the Botox injections. Um, those could be prone to fraudulent billing. Um, so high cost, like an implantable cardiac defibrillator, questionable, like acupuncture, prone to fraudulent billing would be something like motorized wheelchairs. Um, LCDs typically cover procedures and services where there is no NCD and they are not allowed to conflict with a respective NCD or other Medicare policy. And if you want to find your NCDs or your LCDs, for the LCDs you can go to the MAC website and find them, whoever your MAC is. But the easiest place I think to find them is to go to the Medicare coverage database and I've got the link there. You can search by your state, you can search by your MAC, you can search by keyword, you can search by um, CPT codes, a lot of different ways that you can search for the LCDs for your region and your area. So that's the Medicare side of it and management Medicare side of it. Clinical policy bulletins are typically what we associate with commercial payers. So they're very similar to your NCDs and LCDs. They're just published by com your commercial payers. They're payer specific. So each payer has their own set of clinical policy bulletins and they can change fairly frequently up to every six months. They might change what's in their clinical policy bulletin and you need to be aware, you know, that they've made that change. Um, one of the things, Reggie kind of talked about this a little bit, is when there's a clinical policy bulletin or even an LCD or an NCD that applies to these outpatient cases where you're searching for prior authorization or trying to get prior off, consider creating a checklist of the required documentation and diagnoses codes that support the medical necessity of that procedure. So that checklist can be used as education for providers to say before you schedule that total knee, I need to see these 10 things or your payer is not going to pay for it. Um, you can incorporate it into appeal letter template. So if you do get a denial, you can go back and say, look, we had all these things. You wanted 10 items, we get, they're in the record and here's where they are. Here's the 10 items that you need. Um, there's always an exception or a but when you think about LCDs, NCDs, or clinical policy bulletins, sometimes patients don't fit into that square hole, okay? They're a round peg that doesn't fit in that square hole. So always be looking as well for do you have an outlier, um, either in your prior authorization process or in your appeal process. So here's just an example. I just made this up. Um, for someone who, this was a truck driver who was going to have a total knee replacement surgery. As a long distance truck driver, Mr. Jones uh, was unable to complete a course of physical therapy prior to his total knee replacement surgery. He did practice strength training exercises while he was on the road as prescribed by his physician, but he wasn't able to just stay home and go to the physical therapy department, you know, at the outpatient center down the street. So sometimes if you're, if you're 10 things that you need on your checklist, for that particular service or procedure aren't met, there may be a good reason why one of them was not applicable or couldn't be met. So that's another thing to be looking for for your prior authorizations as well as for your appeal. So this is just an example of a clinical policy bulletin. This is for blepharoplasty from United Healthcare. 
And I just have highlighted here when you go to the website, to their website, and look at their clinical policy bulletins, look for the place that says documentation requirements. That's where you're going to find what you need to have in the record in order to get it authorized and get it paid. When you go there, the required clinical information, it has uh, a list of things that they want to see in the medical notes. Okay, so they want to see that it's a planned procedure. They want to see automated or manual taped and untaped reliable visual field testing. They want to see marginal reflex distance, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the things that you need to make sure are in your documentation uh, before you proceed with this procedure. And on the left-hand side are the CP CPT codes that are covered by this payer for this procedure. Just because you have that CPT code on your claim does not mean it's an automatic, they're going to cover it or they're going to pay it or they're not going to deny it. You also have to have the medical notes listed on the right-hand side documented um, in the record. So just having the CPT code isn't an uh, automatic. And that's something we see as well a lot of times with pre prior authorization issues as well is that um, Getting the right CPT code, which Reggie talked about, you know, is you got to make sure you got the right CPT code to send to them because you you could be going back and forth for a while trying to determine whether the procedure that is planned actually marries up to that CPT code and you know, whether it needs prior authorization or not and what it needs in order to be prior auth. So that's that's a really critical component of making sure your prior auth process goes goes smoothly. And then um, finally, like I said, a lot of times there's an out or a but that you can use. You know, every, you need to have everything that we've asked for except in this case. So, for example, in this particular one for blepharoplasty, the out is when the member's not capable of reliable visual field testing, here's your out or your but. My patient could do, we were able to get everything on our patient except the reliable visual field testing. Okay, so let's go through um, some case studies, and then if we've got a few minutes left at the end, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, Carl is monitoring the questions box, and she will throw some questions out to us um, in the last couple of minutes. These are short. Uh, a lot of, when you do have denials because of prior authorization, a lot of times they, and for outpatient procedures in general, a lot of times they are short because there's like one piece of information that's missing or something specific that the payer is looking for. So in this particular case, it was a case where the provider just did not request authorization for a procedure that required authorization. Um, I don't have the reason behind why they didn't request it. I just know this was the case that uh, we worked recently where they didn't request it. So in the appeal letter, um, we state at the top of our letter after we have our demographic information, a summary of facts. So that's the explanation of why it denied. So United Healthcare denied this claim due to no authorization for the EGD um, dilatation. Memorial Hospital is requesting retrospective authorization as the medical necessities clearly established in the clinical record attached. So that's one avenue that you can do and probably already do a lot, we do a lot of it as well, is asking for a retrospective authorization. So an authorization after the procedure has already been done. Some payers will agree to that. Some payers are generous about it. Some papers are, payers are very stingy about it and sometimes will not um, grant retro authorization regardless of, of what you say in your appeal or what your reasons are. So this was a 33-year-old woman. We started our justification for appeal after we had our summary of the facts. A 33-year-old woman who had undergone ruin y um, gastric bypass surgery for morbid obesity five weeks prior. She did well for over two weeks, but then she began to vomit everything she was eating. An upper GI showed a high-grade stenosis of the uh, anastomosis site, and we always like to list where can you find that in the medical record. So let your payers find it easily and quickly so they can quickly rule in your favor. She had undergone one previous dilatation or dilation of the site. Um, so then on February 23rd, she underwent an EGD with balloon um, dilation 
of the cystotic gastrojejunostomy anastomosis. That's a lot of that's a lot of syllables. The surgeon noted that the anastomosis was still friable and somewhat stenotic. So that was enough to get this to get this overturned. They um, said, "Yep, that's fine. We're going to authorize payment um, for that procedure." Okay, so, oh, and this is our little summary. Sorry, I forgot I had a little summary on this one. After we talk about why the um, procedure was required, we do like to kind of wrap it up and, and ask, be very clear about what you're asking for. So her treatment was clearly ordered by the physician the required medical treatment. A qualified physician clearly certified that she required the medical treatment delivered by the hospital. The services rendered were deemed by the physician to be reasonable and necessary for the active treatment of the patient's condition. Her condition would not have improved without the services rendered. Okay, so that was um, retro off for not for a case where authorization was not sought prior to the procedure. This one, our second case study, is for the additional procedure. So Reggie talked about this, where sometimes you have two procedures and you only authorize one, or more commonly we see where one procedure is authorized and then a second procedure was needed or required once they got into the doing the first procedure or into the surgery or whatever. So our summary of facts for this one is that the provider attempted to attain preauthorization for a coronary angiography. Um, the payer representative informed the provider that the authorization was not required for 93458 or CPT code. And it's okay to talk about in your appeal letters what happened with, with your payer communications prior to, you know, the procedure being done. The left, so they went ahead, they did the left heart cath on January 8th. Based upon blockage discovered during the procedure, a stent was placed in the LAD. So the provider submitted an outpatient claim to the payer that included the CPT code for the, the stent, but that they had not requested authorization um, for that prior to the CAF. Um, so our justification for appeal was this is a 61-year-old gentleman, recent development of chest pain, abnormal stress test results, significant ischemia noted suggesting potential LAD disease. He underwent a left heart calf, um, a high-grade proximal left anterior descending stenosis was treated with a Zion's drug eluting stent. The medical record documentation provided demonstrates the medical necessity for the coronary angiography performed and the subsequent uh, stent placement. Therefore, the hospital should be reimbursed for that. Now, Reggie, let me ask you a question. Couldn't they have requested authorization for the stent if they thought they might be doing a stent? They got they got authorization for the calf. Yes, uh, yes. If they're expecting to do that, that's when they need to get authorization. They need to try to get authorization. It's better to get authorization on everything that you think you're going to do. And if you don't do any, then obviously you don't get paid for it. But it, it really hurts us the other way around uh, when they, they do that. But now if it ends up with a stent, remember, you have like 48 hours to notify the, the peer that something different happened. That's pretty much standard that I see in most of the uh, UM manuals. Yeah. Yeah, because it did sound like, you know, obviously they said, yeah, he's, you know, qualifies to have the calf done. And it sounded like, you know, they were pretty concerned for um, disease in the, in the LAD. So, you know, it seemed like, um, you know, they possibly could have asked for it at that time. So our last one, number three, is no off. This was an emergency procedure. So I think this was a very interesting case. Um, denied the following procedure codes for lack of prior auth, um, atherodesis procedures on the spine, and posterior segmental instrumentation, um, three to six vertebral segments. So in this particular case, this is a 58-year-old who had a medical history of metastatic renal cell carcinoma on chemotherapy. He suffered an acute onset and progressive bilateral lower extremity weakness and reduced sensation from below the umbilicus with urinary retention requiring fully catheter replacement. The weakness progressed to the point he could no longer ambulate and his legs became numb. So he was found to have, um, when they did 
um, you know, CT, MRI, whatever, they found to have a destructive mass involving the left posterior element uh, costal vertebral junctions and paraspinal muscles and epidural space from T8 to T10. So that was causing spinal canal stenosis with cord compression and deformation of T9. So this was a, an acute episode that they needed to go in and correct um, right away. And so they did not um, look for prior, they did not try to um, obtain prior authorization ahead of time. He went, underwent the following emergency decompressive surgery. Um, so there's the T7 to T11 surgery, T9 to T10, and T7 to uh, T11. The surgeon documented there was obvious spinal cord compression from the epidural tumor. The tumor was removed and the spinal cord decompression was confirmed with interoperative ultrasound. Um, just to show that, you know, this was the correct thing to do for this gentleman because this was an acute situation. Postoperatively, the oncologist said that he remained in the neural ICU. His weakness was already improving. Um, there's concern for significant remaining tumor that needs expedited radiation. So, you know, we need to work very quickly on this gentleman. He's regained almost all of his strength and sensation in his legs. He feels slightly weak or wobbly when standing, denies paresthesias. Occasional altered sensation of the left foot. Um, his prior severe flank and back pain and pain when looking down have all resolved after surgery. He's feeling optimistic now that his pain is much improved. I just included all of that because I just think that's a really nice summary of, you know, this gentleman's outcome after undergoing this, um, this emergent procedure. Okay, so that's our three case studies. Let's talk about some of the takeaways and then we'll see if we have any questions. So Reggie talked about working with a physician's office to get your referrals and your authorizations a week in advance, uh, developing checklists for those requirements, uh, developing a process for obtaining documentation from the physician's office when there's a question of conservative treatments or other measures when that's required before the procedure can be performed. And a lot of times that's for implants, cardiac procedures, orthopedics. Um, we see that a lot in LCDs, NCDs, clinical policy bulletins, that that's a requirement. It takes a team. So to avoid denials, you need outpatient CDI, coding, medical necessity specialists, maybe billing specialists as well. Make sure you're tracking your denial trends because that's going to point you to the root causes, the issues that you have at your organization that are causing these denials to occur, things that you should be able or may be able to correct on the front end. When you are writing appeals for denials, make sure you're including the medical necessity of the procedure of the service. So it's not just about saying, hey, you know, you told us we didn't need off. So we didn't get off and we did the procedure. You still have to support the medical necessity of it because that's what the payer ultimately is looking for, wasn't medically necessary for that patient. Okay, and I have a couple of pages of references in the handouts, in the slides um, for you for all of the things that um, we talked about today. And so I'm gonna stop there and see uh, any questions that Carla may have uh, pulled out for us. Yeah, I, I see a couple questions here. Um, this has to do with the electronic process that the payers uh, are going to be required to do. Why is the electronic process always easier for the payer? Can hospitals insist payers communicate electronically through hospital EMR? Not availability. Evacor, Navidad, et cetera, or at minimum, a mutually acceptable independent portal. Might as well ask the moon. What's that? I said you might as well ask for the moon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not as a familiar, I don't know, Reggie, if you are with using those portals. I know our support staff um, that help us with appeals, uh, you know, that that's, those are some of the portals that they use sometimes for uh, communication back and forth with the payers. 
Yeah, we stay in the portals uh, a lot. I think it'd be very difficult. Most of your hospital systems, IT departments are not going to let, uh, I would let too many payers inside of my system. So uh, that's a that's always, in fact, I'm, I'm concerned that I that we have on, and I'll just throw this out there, on an inpatient basis that we've got allowed outside uh, entities and payers that have access to the medical record. Uh, because uh, many of the stuff that we see in medical records, I mean, that we're that are getting denied is because the physicians haven't had a chance to do document their documentation yet. So I always say to people, I don't know how how you let people come into your house if your house ain't clean. And that's even in the natural. So it's uh, it kind of amazes me that we've let so many pairs inside of our, our health systems. I think it's pretty dangerous, especially from a UM standpoint. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, here's another one. The MAC denied prior off for a repeat radiofrequency ablation, referencing to CMS prior off operational guide guidelines, which differs and conflicts with the MAC's LCD. So the question is, are you aware if CMS's operational guide supersedes NCDs and LCD guidelines? Well, I hate to say, I'm not going to say yes without, I'm not, you know, I'm not a lawyer to, that interprets regulations and things. I do know that LCDs cannot be more restrictive than NCDs. Correct. And I would, my guess would be that, it, that CMS operational guidelines probably override NCDs, but that's just my guess on that. Okay, here's one for Reggie. Reggie, did you say we have two to three days to get a last minute off for an inpatient procedure after it was done and 30 days for last minute outpatient off after it was completed? Uh, no, basically when I see the authorizations, the date span for most of the inpatient procedures it's usually two to three days. I see what we typically see, and I would again go back to your provider's manual uh, and your the UM section. Usually, you can get an outpatient off that will extend for uh, 30 days, but rarely do you get a. Rarely have I ever seen an inpatient off that is really approved for more than two to three days in advance. And that's I mean I'm talking about in advance. I don't see people giving a 30, 30 day authorization for an in, for an inpatient procedure, but go back and look at uh, your, and that typically is when I see, because what's happened is when, when, when they send it and we call them or when we're writing the appeal, we find out that that authorization has expired and you're trying to do an inpatient procedure uh, and you and you have an authorization and you're doing it 29, 22, three weeks later, I, I don't see that. We don't see that at all. Okay, thank you, Reggie. Okay, one of the issues we see frequently is a patient coming in for an abdominal aortic runoff, which of course notes the peripheral vascular stenosis, which they then revascularize. The revascularization is never authorized, but it's clearly planned from the beginning. These also rarely overturn. Any suggestions? So you did the, the, the go back again. She said she, the vascular author, so the question is, it's, it's like the, it's kind of like the, uh, how, the, how do they put that in vernacular, uh, the egg before the chicken? Uh, uh, you know, you, 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 yeah, if both of those procedures require authorization, you need to be getting other, one of them is going to get denied if one of them, it happens after that one, kind of like what we see, as I said, with the ablation and the 3D mapping, or someone does the stint, but later to find out that really the issue is, is that they uh, should have had the intravascular lipotripathy, uh, they should have had it authorized as well. And I think Denise did another case earlier too, where she showed uh, why didn't they 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 went and they knew they was going to do something even after the cardiac cath. Why didn't they get it all authorized at the same time? 
So it's more of a timing thing and making sure everything, when you're looking at, if you're looking at procedures that need to be done and you know you're gonna do something before that, if that one requires authorization, you need to get all the authorization of all of them at the exact same time. Okay, I'm trying, a lot of these are rather complicated questions. <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> Our patience is very complicated because that's yeah. where a lot of the denials are going today. Yeah. Okay. Put a lot of time um, in them. Is it a valid appeal reason if the physician's office supplied the wrong CPT code for the prior off because their coding skills are deficient? <laughs> Someone's That's got a great a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, the, valid, the validity of the, and I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you guys very much so, is that the, and this, this really is really going to involve having a great operating good PI team that needs to be established between surgery and the people that are doing insurance verification. When they board the case, they really should be boarding the case with the CPT codes that they're going to be doing, the procedure that they're going to be doing. If something different than that occurs or something incidental to that occurs, most of these uh, UM plans and the outpatients tell you you have 48 hours. So I, that's what I see typically that things get done. No one looks at it post after it's done, even if it's posted wrong. Uh, close in the vicinity, and you're absolutely right, the offices are really bad with these codes. Someone needs to see this is exactly what the patient had. Uh, we need to notify the insurance company because it could be, you know, same difference with thinking you're going to have a lap coli, end up with a laparotomy. I mean, everybody said, well, they still had the coli cystectomy, uh, but there's a difference between a laparoscopic coli and a laparotomy. Someone needs to notify the peer that yes, the patient did have a cholecystectomy, but it's even more expensive that they had a laparotomy instead of having a laparoscopic procedure. This is a real, the, the outpatient arena is becoming very tough because no one's got their eyes on it. They're just sending in claims. And we, we set all these things in place for inpatient, but the, the bigger animal in the room now is outpatient because everything is going outpatient. So we really are gonna have to put together PI teams and start looking at them very different. We get a lot of claims that are outpatient, and let me tell you, they are high dollar claims. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's after three o'clock. Reggie and Denise, thank you so much. I know I learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure the audience did as well. For those of you uh, who uh, uh, yeah, lost my train of thought there for a minute. We will uh, answer all the questions that we possibly can that have been asked and give us a couple weeks and then we'll post them on the Adam website right underneath the uh, webinar and, um, and sign up for our next webinar in November. And I think that's it. Thank you all so much for attending. We appreciate it greatly. And um, thank you guys. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye.